This is the second part of the lecture on semiconductor devices for communications and in this lecture we are going to talk about transistors. Last week we were talking about semiconductor diodes and mostly semiconductor diodes were used as non-linear ele elements, so uh, as non-linear components uh, when re we required rectification, when we required demodulation, when we required mixing of two different radio frequency signals. That's where diodes come from. Okay, diodes themselves, they are also able to provide amplification, but they are only two terminal devices, just one single port is available and it's very difficult to build a unidirectional amplifier using diodes. Bidirectional amplifiers are easy, but bidirectional amplifiers are also very unstable, so it's something highly undesirable. So uh, this week uh, we are going to look at a further development of semiconductors, uh, and these are transistors. Transistors in the same way as vacuum tubes evolved from a single vacuum diode, to a, a vacuum tube with a control grid that could provide uh, unidirectional amplification. The same is the purpose of transistors and in, in fact uh, in the 20th century, in the beginning, in the first half of the 20th century, there were many uh, inventors uh, patenting uh, uh, their uh, new amplification devices using semiconductor but the technology was not there yet so they could not manufacture their ideas. So uh, what uh, became in the middle of uh, when became feasible in the middle of the 20th century was to build uh, simple transistors made from germanium. So germanium N dope germanium uh, N type germanium N type dope. Uh, usually this is arsenic, the most common impurity in germanium, and uh, by uh, welding indium balls onto germanium we could make PN junctions, PN junctions, so uh, we could make junction uh, diodes here between this indium ball that's welded onto the germanium surface. And as uh, indium diffuses into germanium, it's the opposite polarity semiconductor, so uh, the op opposite polarity dopant, we get the opposite polarity semiconductor and we get the PN junction here. On all our drawings today, uh, I omitted, I mainly omitted drawing the depletion region uh, inside semiconductors. We did it strictly with diodes. With transistors, of course, there is a depletion region here, there is a depletion region here, but there is no space to draw all those, de those depletion regions in this lecture. Here. So, uh, the first construction was to have uh, point contacts here with indium balls, and these balls should be spaced at a very short distance so that uh, charge carriers from the emitter could travel all the way to collector that would not recombine inside the base of the transistor. This was the theoretical idea how to make a transistor but it was very impractical since it was very difficult to position this uh, indium balls at the right spots to have a very short distance in between. A much more practical solution to make a germanium transistor was to m put these two indium balls from the opposite, si opposite sides of the plate of uh, single crystal germanium in between here. Uh, so we had uh, uh, the emitter and the collector p-doped region approaching from either side and here uh, the distance it was much easier to dis uh, control the distance here between these two p regions so the thickness of the base of this transistor the electrical thickness of the base was much e easier to control here uh, so in uh, with uh, this uh, transistor design became quite popular in the 50s and in the 60s of the previous century uh, many transistors were built using these designs uh, not this one here this was this was just pure theory and the first experiment with, with the transistor, but this was actually a working device that was installed in many radios and other electronic equipment. Uh, germanium was easier to use than silicon, and from these two transistors also come the symbol for the bipolar transistor, uh, with a uh, bipolar junction transistor, so this symbol here comes from the initial 
transistor design and this symbol here comes actually from uh, from this uh, further uh, developed transistor this was this was ac actually a practical transistor is used used in many practical devices so this was mass mass manufactured this transistor uh, how did you grow this p region simply by heating both in your balls if the transistor overheated if the balls heated too much this p diffusion and this p diffusion progressed inside the chip and finally they united so you got a short between the emitter and the collector and such a transistor was simply a short between emitter and collector but it could still be used as a rectifier emitter or collector against the base so it still showed the diode and this was a typical it was a typical failure failure mode for or power germanium transistors PNP transistor because the materials were there there the end doped germanium and the indium welded to the surface of the germanium here in the supporting plate in the metal support there was a hole uh, made in so so that this indium ball could access uh, the other side of the germanium plate here so this was the f were the first transistors say nowadays almost 70 years ago um, what could be done with these transistors well this transistor was not uh, were not electrically very good so uh, these transistors did not possess much gain uh, what do I mean with that I mean with the emitter current should ideally flow wholly to the collector but this ratio was really poor uh, this ratio was uh, defined as the coefficient alpha of the transistor so the amount of collector current for a given uh, emitter current and uh, with old transistor if it was 0 0.9 this was already a good transistor made like this 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 one did not achieve maybe this one achieved uh, 0 0.9 uh, the coefficient alpha this was less than 0 0.9 with this transistor so uh, such a device uh, did not have mar uh, did not have any current gain at all the current gain was less than unity because alpha by definition is less than unity some of the emitter current has to flow to the base so uh, this uh, device did not possess current gain but this device actually possessed voltage gain why voltage gain because if I change the input voltage by a small amount I get I may get a large change of the collector current and if the load resistor here is large enough I can get voltage current uh, here to, just to make an example I took a 12 volt supply 12 volt battery so I have uh, in the quiescent state if I have uh, everything biased for class A operation for small signal operation it's 6 volts on the resistor and 6 volts on the transistor if I calculate the required load resistor and on the other side if I calculate the differential emitter resistors resistor so this em, uh, this emitter is actually forming a pn junction to the base and for this pn junction i can wrote the diode write the diode equation and i calculate the differential resistance on the or the differential conductance here here's the differential conductance related to the emitter just uh, by differentiating the uh, by differentiating the uh, the diode equation uh, I see that the ratio of these two is pretty large uh, so uh, the ratio for these two uh, if I make all calculations I have 6 volts on this resistor and the equivalent voltage here is just 25 millivolts the thermal voltage here so it's 6 volts to against 50, uh, 25 millivolts and I can, I can calculate a voltage gain of 240 of course if I use this as a signal amplifier uh, then uh, I'm mostly interested in power gain how much power how much can I amplify power with this new kind of amplifier uh, if I put in the proper uh, impedance matching so impedance matching transformers here and here uh, what kind of gain I can have I can get I get 240 of uh, voltage gain and I have 0.9 oh, oh, for current gain so in, a, in total I have 216 times the power this is 23 dB so this is quite a useful gain and this was in fact the way the first transistor was being used the first transistor that had a very poor alpha coefficient now uh, better transistors were make, made quite soon from silicon 
and planar technology was used for silicon so uh, things could be, could be handled manufacturing could be handled much easier in silicon so where are we with silicon right now with silicon we can make easily both polarities of transistor we can make a pn pin PNP bipolar junction transistor or an NPN bipolar junction transistor. So we can just flip the volt, uh, the power supplies and flip the direction of the currents in between the two. How are these things made? These, these things are made planar. So all the dif uh, uh, diffusions are made from one side of the silicon wafer and in fact the substrate is much thicker, a hundred times thicker than all this transistor region. That's the reason why these drawings are not to scale here. I mentioned the substrate is usually very thick and this is just a few microns of uh, surface of an epitaxial layer on the surface of the silicon. Uh, we must fa first make a p-doping, a deep p-doping for the base, then we, we make an n plus doping, a very strong doping for the emitter and uh, we make, uh, make also a stronger doping in the base to have a good ohmic contact here, otherwise we would have a rate rectifying junction between the P and the metal base contact. Uh, exactly the opposite polarities apply to the PNP transistor, we make first this N doping for the base, then we make P plus doping for the emitter and we also add an N plus doping to have a good ohmic contact to the base here. So high, high doping concentration usually forms uh, junctions that do not have rectifying, uh, rectifying properties. Uh, in fact, if we want to have a high current gain, uh, not uh, defined by alpha, but defined by beta, both uh, coefficients are related. So beta is the ratio of the collector current to the, to the base current, if emitter is grounded, so if it's a common emitter circuit here. Uh, we can make beta quite large, so most of the currents, most of the charge carriers from the emitter go straight to the collector uh, over the base region. And in order to do this we uh, do not want uh, charge carriers in the opposite direction, so that we don't want holes in the NPN transistor from the base back into the emitter or emi uh, electrons in the PNP transistor from the base back to emitter. We don't want this. In order to achieve this we need a much stronger doping of the emitter than the doping of the collector. So to have, have high current gain we need a very good uh, uh, very good ratio of this, very high ratio of emitter doping, uh, much higher than uh, base doping, so in order to get a high current gain. And of course uh, base should be thin enough, uh, the base should be thin enough so that most uh, charge carriers here uh, from uh, the emitter reach the collector, they do not stop and do, they do not uh, uh, recombine in the base because in the base they are minority carriers. Uh, what is the relationship now between beta here and uh, before we had alpha? Alpha was the ratio collector current to the emitter current, beta is the ratio collector current to the base current. So it's defined somewhat different because now we are talking about a grounded emitter amplifier and this beta may be quite large, in fact a large beta yields, uh, if, beta, if we take beta 200, yields an alpha very close to unity. Uh, okay, alpha it is uh, in fact the historical coefficient, Think was, things were cal calculated, uh, transistors were calculated, but uh, nowadays since alpha is so close to unity it's very difficult to write all these decimal places and have some meaning out of them, uh, we prefer to use beta. Beta is defines our gain, the gain of our transistor in a much better fashion. Beta may reach from 30 for old transistors like old germanium transistors like this one here, this could reach a beta of 30 uh, raising up to perhaps 100, between 30 and 100. But uh, new silicon transistors have uh, betas much higher, uh, the beta of a silicon transistor can go over 1000. So they provide a much higher, uh, much higher uh, current gain. Besides the voltage gain, the voltage gain remains the same as we left it here as we were left with the voltage gain, this, we get the same voltage gain also in the common emitter 
configuration of the transistor. So the idea here was just with a better uh, design of the transistor and better configuration with the common emitter to get besides voltage gain uh, to get also ca uh, current gain. Here we only have voltage gain, while here we have current gain. Uh, some additional uh, details we should uh, learn about uh, bipolar transistors is that this strong doping of the emitter here, or stroke doping of the emitter here, uh, calls for a very low base to emitter reverse breakdown. Uh, this reverse breakdown voltage is just between 3 volts and 15 volts. For uh, transistors for very high frequencies, maybe even less than 3 volts. 15 volts for very low frequency making be high power transistors but this breakdown if it is used on, on the long term it is destructive it destroys this junction here uh, it makes the uh, it makes uh, because of uh, surface effects it builds additional components on the surface of the transistor and this actually kills the current gain of the transistor so it's something we don't to like to use so uh, based to emit a reverse breakdown should not be used in practice because it is destructive long term not short term you can measure the transistor on a measuring device for a few seconds but uh, if this reverse breakdown lasts weeks or months or years the transistor is going to break down it's going to decrease its current gain as uh, uh, and uh, at some point the transistor is no longer useful because its current gain is going down to zero because of this uh, destructive effects of the base to emitter uh, breakdown uh, what is the response of the transistors? So the response of the transistor is if we take just an NPN transistor, if we have the base negative bias uh, towards the emitter, uh, we are in the breakdown region. I didn't draw here the breakdown. I didn't even draw here the breakdown because it is destructive. In the further region, we have the classical CNI of the silicon diode, silicon PN junctions. Here is the base uh, emitter to base junction. And we have the exponential diode equation uh, in front of this. So this is for the NPN transistor. Uh, all polarities are reversed and current direction are reversed in the, with the PNP transistor. So this knick happens in the third quadrant. Here is what is in the first quadrant. This is here is in the third quadrant. But everything else is the same for the PNP transistor. The collector current is simply base time, beta times the base current and the differential resistance but measured on the base not on the meter we have to divide this by E base, I base, we get this by differentiating the diode equation up here. And with transistors uh, the diode equation is quite close to ideal so the diode idealty factor is close to 1 because these rectifying junctions are very shallow and the thermal voltage is 25 millivolts. So we know almost everything now about uh, uh, the electrical behavior of the transistor. To get the highest possible uh, gain out of the transistor, it makes sense to use a uh, common emitter amplifier, to make a common emitter amplifier, uh, to make uh, use the common emitter circuit here. Because this circuit has both voltage gain uh, it turns out to be the voltage gain turns out to be the same if I calculate everything turns out to be the same as for the common base amplifier common emitter and common base amplifier if the other conditions are the same ha should have the same uh, uh, voltage gain of 240 but besides the voltage gain I have a huge uh, current gain a huge current gain given by the beta of the transistor and this is 250 so the power gain is the product of the two and the product of the two 240 times 250 gives 60,000 or uh, almost 48 dB of power gain with similar impedances on the input and on the output because we amplify both the current and the voltage by the same amount so with similar impedances uh, this means that uh, with this amplifier we are not going to need any impedance matching transformer say the output impedance on this amplifier is very although very uh, uh, very close to the input impedance of the next amplifier stage so this is excellent from the common meter amplifier and in fact all present day transistors 
provide the highest gain in the common emitter configuration. The common emitter amplifier is the one that provides the highest gain, especially is this important at high frequencies because at high frequencies transistors provide little gain. Uh, we have little, we have many side effects at high side effects at high frequency that of course kill the gain and uh, we want as much gain as we want at high frequencies. So the common emitter amplifier is the typical choice, is the amplifier of choice for high frequencies to use, make the best use out of the transistors. Uh, we have yet another configuration, this is the common collector configuration. Uh, this configuration is also called the emitter follower. Here we do not uh, really work to have any voltage gain at all. We would prefer to have a voltage gain of unity. It is slightly less than, less than unity because, um, because of this ratio, uh, R, load, R load here divided by R load plus R differential of the base to emitter junction. Uh, if we express both currents, uh, both uh, resistors from the emitter side, here we have uh, R differential for the uh, for the emitter side, and uh, this R differential is much smaller than R load, so we get a voltage gain that is slightly less than unity. But practically, an emitter follower has uh, has the voltage gain very very close to unity. What we look here for is to have the highest possible current gain, beta plus one, I, we could just write here beta because beta is so high, 250, 251 of current gain, and that makes 24 dB of power gain in our case. Uh, an emitter follower is very, very useful in some electronic circuits, not so much at high frequencies, but the uh, emitter follower is used in some signal processing electronics, there it is very useful. So this is to analyze now all three possible amplifiers. We can make an amplifier with a uh, common base amplifier. We can make an amplifier with a, in a common emitter circuit, and we can make an amplifier with the uh, with the common collector circuit. So all three possibilities are uh, are available. Uh, about the transistors, can we exchange base and emitter? Uh, ba ba sorry, can we exchange emitter and collector? We both have, if you remember the old germanium transistors, uh, both emitter and collector have a similar junction towards the base. They look very similar here. Uh, the answer is no for, for uh, modern transistors, because modern transistors have, have a very high doping of the emitter and a very low doping of the collector. High doping of the emitter to have a high beta, and low doping of the collector to have a high breakdown voltage collector to base. So that's the reason why we need low doping here. So these two dopings are not compatible. If I invert in collector and emitter of my transistor, if I invert them, if this is an old transistor, that here it made no difference really here, if I inverted emitter and collector. But with new transistors, uh, it makes a, uh, much a difference. If I invert uh, the emitter and collector connections here. I get a beta perhaps of around 10, so very low beta, very low current gain, and I also have a very low breakdown voltage. Now it's base to collector if I interchange the emitter and the collector, very low, so this transistor will not handle uh, much uh, much of a high voltage for, for its supply. So in, in, uh, in theory for the new uh, types of transistors we have uh, for the new silicon uh, planar transistors, bipolar uh, silicon planar transistors, uh, we cannot interchange collector and emitter. We have some reverse transistor, but it's very inefficient. So if we look at uh, our amplifiers, the best uh, is certainly the common emitter amplifier. And now we have to just to see how to make the, how to make use of this power gain of the common emitter circuit, uh, we are trying to amplify alternating current signals. At, uh, so um, not DC but alternating signals, and we use decoupling capacitors on the base and another decoupling capacitor on the collector. And with suitable resistors, we provide the bias. We provide here a load resistor. This can be already the, our useful load, or we can connect another load on the output. And we also need a base resistor for bias, 
for biasing these transistors. How to achieve uh, correct biasing of these transistors? Okay, for class A operation, what we have here, we would like to have half of the battery voltage, half of the battery voltage on the load resistor. In order to get this, we need an R uh, bias for the base that's twice R load multiplied also by beta. This circuit could work and works quite good with silicon transistors. The only problem here is that the, the current gain of the transistor, beta, uh, has wide tolerances. So uh, we may have very good silicon transistors, but uh, their beta ranges from 100 to 1000. So the lowest selection is 100 and the highest selection is 1000. In fact, uh, manufacturers usually select their, their, their products. So you get them selected from 100 to 200, from 200 to 500 and 500 to 1000, at least in three groups, A, B and C. Uh, this is not something desirable in production if, uh, if, you have a, if you have a component that changes its performance. For instance, if the current gain of this device is uh, twice as large as it should be, we already get the collector into saturation. The collector emitter voltage goes to zero, so we no longer have any amplification. And if this is only this current gain is only one half of those we, we, we expected it to be, we have a very low drop on this resistor, also quite uh, a half smaller uh, voltage gain. So this is also bad. So a much better design to uh, use uh, make a common emitter bias and the bias circuit for a common emitter amplifier is to use a feedback resistor from the collector to the base. Here, if the beta of this transistor is too large, we just get a small drop of the collector voltage since the current through this resistor decreases because it's feedback, it's negative feedback. And if the beta of this transistor is too low, then we have too high voltage in the collector, but too high voltage gives more current to the base. So to compensate for the changes of beta. So this circuit is much more tolerant to the um, manufacturing tolerances of the beta than this circuit up here. So this is much more tolerant. Uh, it also has a drawback. This feedback resistor here provides a negative feedback. This kills some of the current gain of this stage. Some of the current gain of this stage is killed by this uh, feedback resistor here. Uh, there are also things uh, to be found in various textbooks on semiconductors that don't work at all. And one such thing that doesn't work at all is this circuit here. This circuit here is using two resistors as a resistive divider for the base. We should always drive the base with the current, not with a fixed voltage, because a fixed voltage and the negative temperature coefficient of the base to emitter junction means that this stage will go into a thermal runaway. As the transistor heat ups, uh, the base to emitter knee voltage drops, and this means higher current on the base and even more heating on the resistor. So this is actually positive thermal feedback, and this leads to a thermal runaway. So this is not the way to design amplifiers. Uh, I prefer to show this circuit just because people, um, on many occasions, people read stupid textbooks and those textbooks show this transistor. Biasing of a bipolar transistor is never done as in this circuit here. Okay, if we have wide tolerances of our transistor, and this was the case in for germanium transistors. Germanium transistor did not have just a large variation of beta. Germanium transistors also had very high leakage currents on reversed bias junctions. Say the base to collector junction is always reversed bias, but with germanium this has high leakage currents. So it's very difficult now to uh, set the o proper operating point of this transistor. So we s again use a voltage divider to have a f apply a well-defined voltage on the base. And we regulate the current through the uh, transistor through an emitter resistor. This emitter resistor actually kills the voltage gain for DC for this transistor, but to restore the voltage gain for AC, we put a capacitor in parallel. This was very old technique used uh, perhaps in the 50s and in the 60s in the previous century. Uh, 
it is not very efficient has lots of components this capacitor has to be pretty large uh, and it was only required by germanium transistors not by silicon transistor silicon transistors usually do not need uh, circuits that are complicated like this one uh, this is not the case for silicon transistors it's only the case for germanium transistors so uh, in order to use modern transistors made of silicon with planar technology this uh, feedback circuits it's perhaps the best possible solution we have here uh, now we didn't talk anything about the frequency limits of this transistor so we just look here at DC gain here or very low frequency voltage gain with the common base amplifier uh, we have both voltage and current gain in the common emitter amplifier and we can build AC amplifiers but for relatively low frequencies how far can a transistor go with the frequency well this is an effect we already handled with rectifier diodes uh, with PN junction diodes that actually uh, make use of the recombination of minority carriers that cross the PN junction and this capacitance of the minority carrier may be quite large here this additional capacitance is given by the uh, charge storage effect of minority carriers so for PN junction diodes this was a problem but with diodes we had uh, a way around uh, our workaround was to use a Schottky junction here Schottky junction has no minority carriers and has no delay has no additional capacitance unfortunately this is not the case for the transistors uh, in the transistor uh, we need here someone to inject electrons here or someone to inject holes so we actually need a semiconductor that is going to inject minority carriers into the base we cannot do that with Schottky junctions so uh, with uh, transistors we are left with this equation for the base to emitter junction of the transistor and this uh, capacitor uh, generated by the uh, uh, minority carriers slowly recombining minority carriers with the uh, time constant tau uh, actually kills the gain of our transistors at high frequencies it's interesting to notice that uh, uh, the base current actually change, uh, change uh, cancels out in the whole equation for the uh, frequency where the current gain beta starts to drop up at low frequencies we have beta zero this is beta at low frequencies on a logarithmic scale for frequencies but then uh, we have the minus 3 dB point when this uh, if we put F beta down here when this uh, this uh, uh, this equation is equal to just uh, beta 0 divided by square root of 2 of the order minus 3 dB point here this is where beta F beta is the frequencies when beta starts rolling off in the logarithmic scale and finally at some point beta reaches 1 this frequency here is called the transition frequency so at F beta uh, our beta actually decays by minus 3 dB and at the transition frequency uh, the F beta becomes equal to unity what are the typical figures for a transistor so beta 250 beta 0 uh, for low frequencies as we had here for our uh, Plan, silicon planar transistor. This, are, this is for audio frequency transistor. Nothing special. Uh, this uh, F, uh, FT may go much higher than here. 250 megahertz is used for the transistor. Uh, tau, the lifetime of the minority carries 0.16 microseconds with suitable doping, and uh, we get F beta around 1 megahertz. So above 1 megahertz beta of uh, conventional transistors silicon transistor is going to decrease uh, with a beta zero of 250 this curve will reach will reach uh, unity gain at 250 megahertz so we know what are the figures for a conventional audio frequency transistors okay we could do 100 times better with suitable transistor especially with germanium doping of the base we could do much better here uh, the equation now is simply for the beta decaying I uh, just used here beta as a 
as a ratio of absolute value if these are alternating currents, if these are phasors, I take the absolute value of this ratio, so it's just the magnitude here. And this is beta 0 divided by 1 plus 2 pi f uh, time uh, the time constant Rd, the differential resistance and uh, c c capacitance of the minority carriers that are generated. And this is all transferred to the collector. Uh, faithfully transferred to the collector junction and uh, the collector current is simply a, mul a multiply of the base current here. but this capacitor is eating much of the base the base current and that's that is the problem here that's the reason why this curve decays also at very high frequencies this decay will be even faster than this so this ft is actually usually with transistors is calculated from f beta but at higher frequencies we have other effects that make the gain decay so say if you have a transistor with the declared uh, transition frequency of 20 gigahertz this transistor is no longer going to amplify 20 gigahertz uh, it may amplify frequencies up to 5 gigahertz because above 5 gigahertz there are, there are other effects that further pull down the gain curve of the transistor we talked about base resistance and base resistance is yet another nasty feature here so we insert an additional resistance here because since base has little doping, should have little doping to have a high beta, then the base itself has a high resistance from base here to base here. And this base resistance causes additional problems. As uh, the base current is growing, the voltage drop on this uh, R base is uh, decreasing. So for low currents, uh, the charge carriers, the electrons in the case of an MPN transistor, go directly from the emitter to the collector following this path here. But if I apply a strong current on the base, then here the voltage drop is much lower than here, say here, from here to here. So transistor will prefer to take a route around, a much longer route, filling a much uh, thicker base, and many of these uh, electrons get lost inside the base, so the beta goes down. At high currents, the beta goes down. Even faster is the, K, the decay OFT of the transition frequency. Why? Because uh, the electrons, not just that they go a longer route here, uh, causing the beta to decay, but this longer route here uh, also means uh, additional delays introduced by, introduced by the resistor so also FT comes down and comes down even faster than beta so at high currents uh, all transistors, most of the transistors uh, uh, the beta, both beta and FT of most transistors decay a partial solution to these problems is to dope the base with germanium if we have germanium with the base we can reduce uh, because of the different thermoelectric contact voltages with the N plus emitter, we can reduce uh, the, we can increase the doping of the base, and in this way it reduce the, reduce the base resistance. So this can be partially compensated with germanium doping of the base. Uh, in a similar fashion, uh, carbon doping or diamond doping of the collector uh, actually improves the increases the. Uh, the breakdown voltage of the transistor. This is yet another small improvement, but the most improvement for us for communication is that we can increase actually our FT. Uh, we can increase the FT. We can shift it to higher frequencies by have a, a smaller base resistance here. Uh, bipolar transistors have yet another nasty feature, and the temperature coefficient of a forward bias PN junction is negative. 2.2 millivolts minus 2.2 millivolts per degree Kelvin and this may cause a secondary breakdown how? Uh, usually the breakdown is considered when either the voltage uh, is exceeded the maximum collector to emitter voltage the maximum uh, collector current is exceeded or the maximum power defined in this uh, quarter circle here uh, the maximum power is exceeded because we can no longer cool the transistor but because of this uh, temperature coefficient being smaller than one, what can happen if we have many transistors in parallel? Uh, if some transistor takes a higher current, it will overheat. Overheating, because of the negative TC, will take an even current, higher current. 
again overheating because of the even lower tensity we have we had another current so we get all the current concentrated in just one single transistor of the many transistors connected in parallel and this effect is called the secondary breakdown secondary breakdown happens at higher collector to emitter voltages not at low voltage but at high voltages and it further limits the safe operating area of our transistor it, it's a further limit uh, so uh, uh, we should consider when designing a transistor circuit we should consider the whole uh, say, uh, both effects in defining the safe operating area how can we improve uh, the performance of the transistor so that it is not so prone to breaking the, in breaking down because of the se uh, uh, second of, uh, <coughs> because of secondary breakdown uh, to put in all emitters to put emitter ballast resistors these emitter ballast resistors are able to equalize the currents between different transistors so even if the base to emitter junction voltage is decreasing in a particular transistor this emitter current will uh, this emitter ballast resistor will uh, make this the change of the current through this transistor much smaller because uh, actually we get this drop and uh, a drop uh, here uh, will be compensated by this resistor partially compensated so we are still not at best we still have this effect but this effect the, the, its effect is much smaller if we have emitter ballast resistors what this emitter ballast resistor actually cause in our circuit circuit they kill voltage gain they decrease the voltage gain of this resistor because we don't have just the differential resistance of the base to emitter junction forward bias but we also have this emitter resistance in series so the voltage gain here will be now much much smaller this voltage gain I will not have just the differential resistance plus RE should be here so so it becomes it becomes smaller it, the voltage gain drops so it's not uh, but uh, we have to use these resistors if we don't want to kill our device with the secondary breakdown how many transistors do we connect in parallel well uh, you may be interested to learn that uh, if we are talking at transistors that provide gain at one gain at one gigahertz one gigahertz is nowadays a common frequency used for mobile phones phones this frequency range is used in mobile phones even for small signal transistors they require 10 10 emitters with 10 ballast resistors but if we have a power transistor like a transmitter output power transistor that transistor may require at 1 gigahertz about 1000 emitters to equalize the currents in the different transistors how are this uh, uh, how are these uh, resistors uh, made how are these transistors uh, power RF transistors made uh, okay for a radio frequency operation we need a very low base resistance we told that here so we need quite shallow diffusions here so that this base resistance is the smallest possible and we build our transistor as a parallel uh, connection of many emitter fingers and the bases in between this base distribution circuit this P plus diffusion is just to have the base at the same potential with respect to the emitter so to get the same current from every single transistor from every single emitter uh, this is the design for all power transistors but for radio frequency power transistor this diffusion is very shallow here since this diffusion is very, this diffusion are very shallow, we actually need emitter ballast resistors, and these emitter ballast resistors are selected for a particular operating frequency and particular operating points. Uh, the same transistors that, that works fine at a certain frequency, uh, that is only defined for operation at a certain frequency, will fail at lower frequencies because at lower frequencies our current gain goes up as the current gain goes up also the secondary breakdown becomes more difficult to handle and that's the reason why power transistors are usually power radio frequency transistors are usually specified to operate just at a single frequency where these uh, resistors were calculated if we go to lower frequencies I may get secondary breakdown if I put higher resistor values like I would need at lower frequencies I need higher resistor then the voltage gain goes down so at the high frequency I no longer have any gain 
so it's a uh, uh, it, it, it's a here is really a compromise between uh, voltage gain I can get of the transistor and uh, here uh, uh, tolerance to secondary breakdown. So these two things don't go together in, in the case of a transistor, bipolar transistor. Uh, so how are not these transistors built in a suitable package? So uh, the chip of the transistor always has a common collector. This is this was already dis described here with planar technologies. So uh, as long uh, ger on the other hand, the germanium transistor had a common base. Base was the common electrode for germanium transistors. Uh, germanium transistors had the base to be connected to heatsink, while uh, silicon transistors usually need the collector to be connected to a heatsink. Uh, germanium is no longer used, also has poor performance, poor radio frequency performance. But silicon is excellent at high frequencies, except for the detail that this substrate that is grounded is actually an electrode we don't want to have grounded in a common emitter circuit. In a common emitter circuit we want the collector floating, RFY is floating, and we want the emitter grounded electrically grounded, grounded with a small inductivity because if we add inductivity with the emitter circuit we actually get the same as with the transistor. If we put an inductivity in the emitter LED here we actually kill the gain. If we have a common inductivity for the common emitter circuit we have it in the common circuit in the inductivity this also kills the gain. So this is not the way to go. So uh, these transistors are usually the chip itself has a common collector, but this common collector is insulated from the heatsink and as insulator is usually used the beryllium ceramic, beryllia, beryllium oxide. Beryllium oxide is a very hard ceramic but also very toxic, its power is very toxic and this can be welded both to the silicon chip and on the other side, side to the heatsink flange, can be attached to the heatsink flange, so remove heat from these transistors. Uh, both emitter, uh, both base and collector, so the input hour amplifier and output hour amplifier, require impedance matching. Impedance matching, why? Because the input impedance here of this RF transistor, if this is a, a resistor with uh, 1000 fingers, 1000 emitters, uh, the resistance here is less than 1 ohm. Also, the output resistance here is less than 1 ohm. So, the, with such low impedance, with, with impedances, we need step up transformers. And these step up transformers are usually built with an inductor and with the capacitor. Okay, the inductor and the capacitor only work for just one frequency. And we select this inductor and this capacitor for the intended frequency of the operation of this transistor. So, power transistors are usually internally impedance matched with inductors that are just bonding wires. And capacitors, these capacitors are usually uh, MOS capacitors made on silicon, high quality, high Q MOS capacitors. Uh, all the resistors or the meter ballast resistors are connected in parallel on the other and are grounded directly on the flange of these transistors. This transistor, I couldn't draw this on this page because I don't have space back here. So these are all connected to the emitter flange here. So in this way, a very complicated and expensive package solves the deficiencies of our semiconductor chip here. So this is the solution how to design this transistor. Okay, radio frequency transistors, that are, that's the reason why they are quite expensive. Not because of this whole, on, the, the bare chip, because of the many bonding wire. Here if we need a smaller inductivity, we need many bonding wire in, wires in parallel, so complicated bonding, but especially complicated uh, uh, package of this transistor using including beryllium ceramic. In our semiconductor devices we would like to avoid using expensive and highly toxic material as beryllium ceramic. That's the reason why we prefer to, the, to avoid this thing. Uh, with, this, uh, with all this I hope that I explained here most of the details about uh, bipolar transistors. Uh, but besides bipolar transistors, we also have field effect transistors and things are a little bit different, but they are made of the same semiconductors, silicon, but also other semiconductors for bipolar transistors. 
so about uh, we are going to talk next hour about field effect transistor the whole hour the, the second part of this lecture will be devoted to uh, field effect transistors of different kinds made of di made on, of different kinds of semiconductors uh, so this is uh, for our next hour and then we are done with semiconductors and we can look at more detailed properties of our amplifying devices. Today uh, the issue was just to get to get some gain, to get some output power, to get up with frequency. But we have to look at more details in the following lectures uh, about transistors.